Well, good afternoon, dear friends. Uh, Reverend Ron Johnson here from First United Methodist Church in Yankton, South Dakota. And I hope that this day finds you staying well and staying strong and staying hopeful in the midst of the challenges that we continue to face daily. Uh, before I get into uh, today's message, I would like to uh, say thank you, of course, to Corey Infield, Pastor Corey, who takes care of the technology side of all of this, and uh, I do appreciate his work because he's uh, forgotten more about this than I'll ever know. So uh, he is a valuable asset here in making sure we get these messages out. Uh, I would also like to tell you about a couple of other things that I'm um, thankful for this week. Uh, work has begun on our church roof, and they're taking off uh, the, the foam and the shingles that are on our roof. And uh, when that's done, we'll have people move in and start to put uh, the steel shingles on. So we're looking forward to that, and you can drive by and observe the progress with this. The weather today is kind of putting a damper on it, but uh, hopefully it'll get better as we move in further into the week. The other thing is I want to congratulate a young man from our church, Cooper Corneman, who received the Spirit of Sioux Award yesterday at the school. And uh, of course, Cooper is a senior uh, basketball player, all-state basketball player for the Yankton Bucks. And, and he was awarded this honor yesterday along with five other high school young people in the state of South Dakota, uh, three young ladies and, and three young men. And uh, I think it's based upon uh, their academics and their involvement in the community. So having watched Cooper grow up for the last 10 years, um, I, it doesn't surprise me that he's being honored in this way. And uh, I wish him well. and. Uh, Again, on behalf of his church family, we congratulate him. I want to uh, share today from two portions of Scripture, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament from the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, I'd like to read from chapter 14 of Exodus, verses 19 through 31. And this is taken from the time when the Hebrew people are making their way out of Egypt into the pro and go heading towards the promised land and uh, thinking all is going well and then they come up to what we would call maybe a fork in the road as they are coming against the, up against the Red Sea and they realize that the Egyptian army is hot on their trail and um, pursuing them and they know they're in danger and the question is, what are they going to do? So we take it up at verse 19. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved in front of them and took its place behind them. And it came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel, and so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night, and one did not come near the other all night. And then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, and the water forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, and all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. And at the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. And he clogged their chariot wheels so they turned with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and their chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. 
and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers and the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, and not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, and the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. And thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, believed in the Lord, and in his servant, Moses. And then I would like to have us turn over to the Gospel according to Matthew. And we're going to read from chapter 14, beginning at verse 22 through 33. And this is Jesus walking on the water. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the land, for the wind, I should say, was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. May God add his blessing and understanding to the reading of these verses. For this is the word of the Lord to us this day, my dear friends. Let us pray. Father, I ask that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was drawn this week to these two scripture texts that made connection with my life and what you and I are presently dealing with in the midst of this ongoing health crisis called COVID-19. And I'm sure many of us are familiar with these accounts of the Israelites at the Red Sea and Jesus walking on the water to rescue his terrified disciples. But how do they connect with us as we face another day of following the protocol and the guidelines to help us nav navigate the difficult course we are on presently? Well, I want to identify two connections in the hope that they will connect up meaningfully with our present situation. The first thing that began to come clear for me in both of these stories was the truth that M. Scott Peck makes so much of in his book, The Road Less Traveled. And that book has been around for a number of years. And if you read it, you may remember that it begins with this sentence, that life is difficult, period. And he makes no attempt to qualify that life is not difficult for some people, at some time under some circumstances. But Peck claims that it is difficult for everybody all the time, even when we are attempting to do right and are obedient to the best that we know. And the thing that jumped out at me from both of these scripture passages was that even when people are doing right, that is following the instructions that they had been given from life, or from God, I should say, even then, life was difficult. 
So here were the Israelites doing exactly what God had commanded them to do after all their struggles in Egypt. And that long last, we read that they are on the move out of that land of oppression and toward the promised land of freedom. And what happens to them? Well, they get to that ominous looking Red Sea and they find the Egyptian army bearing down upon them. And here in the Matthew text are the disciples not foolishly or willfully venturing out on their own, but doing exactly what Jesus had instructed them to do. And they get to the middle of that little body of water in northern Galilee called the Sea of Galilee, and out of nowhere the winds began to blow, and it seems for all the world as if they're going to drown. Now this characteristic of life as we know it is not something with which it is easy to come to terms. And yet Scott Peck is right, I think, in, in, in asserting that we will never get very far in life until we do just that. So let's face it. Difficulty, complication, struggles have been and are and will be an essential component of our lives upon this earth. And try as we will, there's no evading or avoiding this fact. Now back when I was a freshman in college many moons ago, my first year in college, my parents' marriage blew up. And I really had trouble coming to terms with why God allowed that to happen. And I was doing exactly what I felt God had called me to do. And bam, life took a detour. And it goes without saying that I was mad at God. I was frustrated with life. And I wanted to quit. And maybe some of you know that in your own life. Well, in his great epic poem, The Odyssey, the poet Homer describes how Ulysses and his army were moving toward Troy with a specific plan of attack when they came to a river that was flooded because of unseasonable rains upstream. And this was long before the days of pontoon bridges, so there was nothing for Ulysses and his men to do but wait for the flood waters to subside. However, the general was so frustrated by the complications of his plan that he allegedly waded out into the flood water up to his knees and he whipped wildly at the, at the way he would have at, when he was thrashing a horse. Now what could be more futile really than thrashing a flood, which many in our area would have been tempted to do with all the flooding that we've had in previous years. But it did not cause the water to go down a minute sooner. And yet, think of all the times that we have all let the intrusion of the unexpected drive us to utterly irrational and counterproductive behavior. That stubborn fact that life is difficult can cause us to blow up in rage and frustration. And by the same token, we have all known other people who just simply collapsed like tents in the face of their difficulties. And they gave up altogether. Now I'm wondering, who is it in your life that serves for you as a model of how you choose to cope with the fact that life is difficult. And because of their model, you long to emulate how they've handled those difficult times. Well, some time ago, the late Irma Bombeck, who is famous for writing books such as If Life is a Bowl of Cherries, Why Am I Always in the Pits? And How Can I Be Over the Hill When I Haven't Seen the Top Yet? Well, in a particular article, she departed from the usual humor style that she would use to make a profound point in dealing with the difficulty of life. And this is what she writes. 
Ironically, these two events happen within a day of each other. On the first Saturday of the last month, a 22-year-old tennis player, a U.S. tennis player, hoisted a silver bowl over his head at center court at Wimbledon. And then on the day before, five blind mountain climbers, one man with an artificial leg, an epileptic, and two deaf adventurers stood atop the snow-capped summit of Mount Rainier. And it was a noisy victory for the tennis player who shared it with 14,000 fans, some of which who had slept on the sidewalks outside the club for six nights waiting for tickets. But it was a quiet victory for the climbers who led their own cheering. There was a lot of rhetoric exchanged at Wimbledon regarding bad calls. At Mount Rainier, they learned to live with life's bad calls a long time ago. The first man to reach the mountaintop tore up his artificial leg in getting there. And somehow in all of this, I see a parallel that all Americans are going to have to come to grips with. In our search for heroes, we often lose our perspective. We applaud beauty pageant winners, ignore the women with, uh, without limbs who paints pictures with a brush in her teeth. We extol the courage of a man who will sail over 10 cars on a motorcycle, and we give no thought or parking place to the man who threads his way through life in a world of darkness and silence. Not all winners are heroes, and not all physically challenged people are heroes, but hero is a term that should be awarded to those who have given a set of circumstances react with courage, dignity, decency, and compassion. People who make us feel better for having seen them or touched them. And Bombeck closes, I think the crowds went to the wrong summit and cheered the wrong champion. Well, friends, I think she's right. Because those who chose to make not just the best, but the most of their situations they encounter, which are less than perfect, I believe they are the real heroes of life. And we all find ourselves at times in situations like these Hebrew people and the Jesus disciples were facing. We're doing what we're supposed to do, and still we find that Red Sea right there in front of us, and an Egyptian army like COVID-19 bearing down behind us. Or out in the middle of a, of a lake where we have been sent, like me getting my education to be a pastor, and suddenly storms blow up like my parents' marriage blew up, that appear for all the world about to drown us. And the question arises, where do we find the courage in the midst of a life that is genuinely difficult to keep on coping, coping and neither blow up in counterproductive anger or crumble in deadening despair. Well, here is where the other connection between these stories and my story begins to emerge. If you ponder the two images of that mysterious wind that began to blow from the east and parted the Red Sea, and that figure of Christ walking across the water, and suddenly it strikes you, crises do have a way of bringing their own special influence with them. And in almost every case, they are as unexpected as the forms, as, of, like the wind and the figure walking toward them across the waves. These two ancient stories subtly connect with things that I have witnessed and experienced in my own life, and I felt myself encouraged. And as I have reflected, I remember occasion after occasion when I too have been seemingly trapped between the Egyptians and the Red Sea or about to drown in a, in a storm and mysteriously, inexplicably, in the midst of my crisis, a positive influence appeared and the balance shifted. The situation with what I faced when I was in college with my parents' uh, marriage blowing up 
There were people that came to my door and found me in the hallway who heard about my situation, wrapped their arm around me, took me aside, gave me words of hope and comfort, and listened to me. And that was the positive influence that I needed and didn't expect. And a year ago, some of you from our church will remember my wife who uh, was having trouble with her sight and they ended up finding a, a benign tumor on her pituitary gland and we went to Mayo and there were positive influences that appeared there as well, especially her surgeon who said on her initial uh, exam with him, turned around and looked at me and he said, she's gonna be all right. She's gonna make it. And I knew without a doubt with his words that things were going to work out well. Well, the best way for me to explain this is that I was met in the worst of times by energies I knew nothing about ahead of time, nor could I explain afterward. All I know is the Lord did provide as he promised he would beginning with Abraham and all through the history of Israel and coming to trust in that is enormously encouraging to me as I face my future. The second connection that I found between these two stories from Scripture and my story does not alter the first. That life has been, that life is, and that life will be difficult. But it brings new hope into my heart about the future for what happened back then at just the right moment the wind beginning to blow and parting the sea and Jesus walking on the water toward the frightened disciples is exactly what has happened to me again and again in my life. Crises can bring their own special power-filled influences that are mysterious and inexplicable. But they do come and they do save. And I do believe they are rooted in God who never abandons or forsakes us and who can be counted on to provide for us. And this faith, based on what has happened in the past, becomes my hope for what will happen in the future. I do not expect the not yet experienced to be easy. And it will probably be marked by difficulty as it has been in the past. But I do expect to be companioned and empowered by our gracious God as mysteriously and unexpectedly as were those Hebrew people and those disciples. And what that east wind and figure walking on the water represent, I am prepared to trust. And not a, in a minute too soon, not in a minute too late, in a form that will always surprise and astonish I believe our loving God will provide. And that trust gives me the courage to move out into the future in hope and confidence. All of which speaks mightily to the situation that our world, meaning you and I, are facing at this very moment. So friends, let me close by saying again, that life is difficult for everybody. Even when you are doing what you're told and you're not exempt from complications and difficulty. So how do then do we expect to respond to this? Well, I think it's so easy to spend our energies in rage or just give up altogether and quit like I wanted to back in college. But remember, there are blind people and lame people who, in spite of the bad calls of their situations, have wound up climbing peaks like Mount Rainier. And we don't have to let the things that happen to us absolutely defeat us, which leads me to say that the east wind, which inexplicably began to blow and part the waves, that mysterious figure who came walking across the water in compassion 
and health in us. Those are the reminders to me that crises like the one we are presently facing bring their own special, powerful influences with them. And that in the midst of the absolute worst, again and again, the best often appears. And from that wind and in the presence of that kind of Christ, we too can take what seems to be insurmountable and we can find a way through and we can find a way out. I've learned that memory <clears throat> is, <clears throat> is always the basis of hope. And the way of goodness and mercy have come to us mysteriously and unexpectedly in the midst of our crisis. That becomes our hope for what shall be. My friends, without a doubt, I believe the Lord will provide. And you and I can count on it. And in that trusting is the courage to cope. I came across this quote the other day, and I want to finish with it, or this afternoon. It simply says, Faith is the bird that feels the light and sings when dawn is still dark. Well, in the midst of uh, the darkness that we face and the uncertainty and the unknown of this health crisis we are in, have faith that God's wind will blow and will provide a way out and a way through. And Jesus will come to right where we are. Take hope in that. Take comfort in that. God will provide. Our future is certain in him. Trust in him. Listen for his voice. So stay strong, stay connected, and stay grounded in your faith in God. Let us pray. Lord God, as we bow before you today, thank you for the hope that you bring through your word. As we think of the story of the parting of the Red Sea and as we think of you coming to the frightened disciples in the midst of a storm, we pray, our God, that we will take comfort and hope in hearing these stories as it applies to our lives and the situation that we face. Lord, help us to believe without a doubt that you will provide. And help us to trust that you are going to allow your wind to blow and that we will find a way out and a way through this pandemic and that Jesus will come to be with us right where we are. Thank you for that promise, that hope, that assurance. For we pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. Have a good rest of the day and a good rest of the week, and we'll look forward to catching up with you in just a few days as we gather for Sunday worship and again next Wednesday for our midweek message. I love you. God bless you all.